Uh, good morning, everyone. So today we are going to continue with the second part of my uh, mini course on spin C structures and geometric application. So if you remember what we said yesterday, uh, we have defined the Dirac operator on uh, our N, and uh, we have seen that we we are we, we are we were able to define. Uh, the Dirac operator on Rn uh, at the square root of the Laplacian by using the Pauli matrices and uh, etc. So today we are going to define the spin or spin C structure and the Dirac operator but on manifolds. So what we did yesterday was locally. Now I'm trying to define something globally. So I will start my first definition. I'm going to consider a Riemannian manifold oriented and compact and a Dirac bundle on my manifold is a complex vector bundle of rank L so this is my rank, equipped with the following. One, a Hermitian metric and a connection, of course, that I'm going to denote Nabla which satisfies x of psi phi is nabla x psi phi plus psi nabla x phi we say that the connection nabla parallelizes the metric and uh, so here I should write it as a metric, of course. Yeah, for every psi phi section of the complex vector bundle of rank L, and for any x tangent vector element in my tangent bundle. So that's the first ingredient. The second one. I need also to have a linear map, a C infinity linear map, gamma. So this linear map is from tangent bundle to the endomorphism of sigma of n, such that it satisfies the following three properties. One, I'm going to call it one. If you take gamma x of psi phi uh, plus psi nabla x phi, this is zero. So gamma, we say that anti-commute if you want. Uh, two, nabla x of gamma y phi it's gamma nabla xy applied to phi plus gamma y nabla x phi. And the last property, property number three, is gamma x gamma y plus gamma y gamma x is minus two g of x y. Maybe the last property or property number three reminds you of the Clifford multiplication uh, that we spoke about uh, yesterday in my introduction where we denoted by BJ the Pauli matrices and we said BJ, BK plus BK, BJ is, is zero B, when J is not equal to K. Or uh, this also reminds you from or the definition of the Clifford algebra, which is the, the, the real Clifford algebra defined by or generated by uh, elements such that x Clifford y plus y Clifford x or u Clifford v plus v Clifford 
u is minus two the scale product of u and v. So uh, maybe, uh, of course, here x, y are the tangent bundle, psi phi are sections of my complex vector bundle of rank L. And of course, just to mention here that the connection appearing here is the Levi Civita connection uh, on my manifold. However, the following two connections here and here are, of course, the connection defined on the complex vector bundle of Frank L. And maybe uh, it seems for you very abstract what I'm asking for. So if I come back to my previous slide, I'm asking for a Hermitian metric that parallelizes, that parallelizes the match, uh, uh, or that is parallelized by a connection at love. And I'm asking uh, for a linear map gamma that satisfies the following three conditions, one, two, and three. So the first question that comes to your mind is, why do we need the existence of such a map gamma. That's my first question. And second, why do we ask gamma to satisfy the, pre the conditions that we called one, two, three? These are two natural questions that, of course, comes to your mind once we see the definition of the Dirac bundle. So again, for the Dirac bundle, you need a complex vector bundle with the Hermitian metric, a connection, uh, and you need the existence of a linear map, gamma, that satisfies the previous three properties. And now I'm going to answer these two questions before we, we proceed. So um, on a Riemannian manifold, so why do we need it on a Riemannian manifold? Given a complex vector bundle with a connection and a metric, we have not any trivial any non-trivial, sorry, natural first order operator acting on sections of sigma. So we do, we do not have a non-trivial first order differential operator. However, we have a second order that we spoke about the, uh, yesterday, which is the Laplacian. However, we have a second order operator, which is the Laplace operator. that all of us, you know, we will denote it by delta. How, but now when gamma exists, this linear map, when it exists, we can define we can define a natural first order operator and that's why we need gamma d by, so it acts on the section of sigma of m, and for any psi, it gives you d psi defined by sigma j from 1 to n, gamma ej, nabla ej of psi. Of course, ej is a local orthonormal basis, Tangent to M. So this answer may be the first uh, question. Why do we need gamma? We need gamma in order to define a natural first order operator D. 
in the following way. And maybe to answer the second question, why do we need gamma to satisfy condition one, two, three? Because condition one, two, three are needed to get some properties of t. So I need the condition one, two, three um, of, the, of, of the linear map gamma in order to get some beautiful properties of the operator d that I'm not able to say yet that it is a Dirac operator. And I'm going to show in the next proposition that condition one and two will give us that the, Dirac, uh, that the operator D is self-adjoint with respect to the L2 scalar product, of course, by assuming that the manifold is without boundary. And condition two and three, for example, um, uh, uh, will, will give that the square of the Dirac, uh, uh, the square of D, I mean D squared, and the Laplacian have the same principal symbols. So, I mean, if you take D squared minus the Laplacian, you are going to get a, 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 a first or a zero order term. So, we will see that this in the next, in, in the next minute, that conditions one, two, and three are essential to get beautiful property of the operator. That's why I'm going to start with my next proposition. So just to tell you that I didn't define yet spin C structures, spin structures, or etc., or the Dirac operator. So now I'm assuming that I have on my manifold a Dirac bundle, so uh, of rank L, uh, and uh, and with with Hermitian metric, of course, with a connection and a good linear map gamma that satisfies condition one to three. Okay, and so proposition: if you have a Dirac bundle. So sigma m with connection and uh, with the Hermitian metric and the map gamma. That's how I'm going to denote from now on the Dirac bundle. And uh, over a compact manifold m. Okay, then. Uh, if M is without boundary, so the boundary of M is empty, then D is formally self-adjoint with respect to the L2 scalar product given by the integral of the volume, the volume element, and the condition and property number two, and uh, that if you take the square of the Dirac, of the operator D, sorry, because I'm still keeping, or I'm still uh, telling you that D is a Dirac operator, not yet, and the Laplacian uh, have the same principle. Symbol. In fact, it is the Dirac operator, but it's a different form of the Dirac operator anyway. So uh, what I'm going to do next is that I'm going to prove, uh, let's come back, I'm going to prove the first property that D is formally self-adjoint. And for one, I'm going to use the property one and property two of gamma. And uh, in the second uh, property, D squared and the Laplacian have the same principal symbol. I'm going to use uh, condition two and condition three of gamma. Okay, so let's prove uh, point one, uh, the first part, that uh, D is formally self-adjoint. So I'm going to consider two sections of uh, sigma of M. That I will try to calculate d psi phi. Of course, by definition, this is sigma j from 1 to n, gamma ej, nebula ej psi. That is the definition of the operator d. And now, of course, using property 1, 
of gamma, you can write it as minus sigma nabla ej of psi gamma ej phi j from 1 to n okay so now um, you can decompose and write but this is nothing and minus sigma j from 1 to n ej applied to psi gamma ej phi minus psi nabla ej gamma ej of phi I use that nabla parallelized the metric and to close it here and now using condition the property 2 of uh, gamma I'm going to write it as minus sigma j from 1 to n ej psi gamma ej phi of course plus as you can see here this is a definition of the operator d so I'm going to get plus psi d phi so now the uh, I still have to deal with this blue term here but of course this is you can easily write it as minus divergence of the vector x1 minus i divergence of the vector x2 plus psi d phi so this is a psi here where x1 x2 are, are two vectors defined by gx x1 of applied to y plus i x2 applied to y is psi gamma y of phi. So it's very really easy here to calculate the divergence and uh, to get the, that the minus divergence of x1 minus i divergence of the vector x2 is equal to this blue quantity. So uh, in total, conclusion, what I'm going to get is d psi phi is psi d phi minus divergence of x1 minus i divergence of x2. Of course now finally integrating integrating over m the manifold which is compact we get the result so what do we get that my operator d is formally self-adjoint with respect to the l2 scalar product now <coughs> now i need to prove the second point that d squared and the laplacian uh, uh, have the same principle have the same principle symbol so i'm going to take psi gamma of sigma and m and try to calculate d squared of psi let's see so that sigma gamma ek nabla ek of d psi if k goes from 1 to n which is sigma k, k go from 1 to n gamma ek by nabla ek of sigma j from 1 to n gamma ej nabla ej of psi and now i need to calculate the covariant derivative nabla ek of uh, this quantity let's do it and here guys i'm going to use the property 2 of gamma to get sigma k1 and j also from 1 to n in one sum gamma ek gamma ej nabla ek nabla ej of psi but here of course 
I use that my orthonormal frame or my basis um, satisfies Nabla EJ EK are equal to zero. So, <coughs> so here I'm assuming that at, I'm doing my calculation locally at the point X where Nabla EK EJ at the point X is zero. So I get this one. Now using property three of gamma, I will get minus sigma nabla e j nabla e j of psi j from one to n. So what I did that is I took the first case when j is equal to k here. Then the second case when j is not equal to k. So I'm going to get j from one to n nabla e j nabla e j of psi plus sigma where k is not j, but of course k and j goes from 1 to n. So gamma ek, gamma ej, nabla ek, nabla ej, so Again, this is equal to minus j from 1 to n nabla ej nabla ej of psi of course this is a laplacian acting on the section of sigma of m plus as for the second term here i'm going to divide it into two terms uh, if k is less than j and if j is less than k so to get plus sigma k strictly less than j going from one to n of course so gamma ek gamma ej so when nabla ek nabla ej and when j is less than k then you interchange to get minus nabla ej nabla ek so and of course this the first term here is the laplacian acting on psi and for uh, the second term here, you agree if I put it half sigma ij from 1 to n, gamma ej ei, if you want, I'm changing i and k gamma ej. And of course, this is the curvature of the connection nabla or ei ej. Of psi. So where R here is a, tens, uh, is a tensor curvature associated with the connection nabla. So as you can see, d squared again is equal to the Laplacian plus half sigma the curvature term or the curvature tensor associated with the connection lambda. This means that d squared and the Laplacian have the same principle symbol. So I'm done with the property number two. Now, uh, before we define the spin C structures, I'm going to uh, give a remark. And the condition three, as I said, is similar, is the same defining the Clifford algebra on Tm, on the tangent, on the vector space Tm. So, the map, gamma, can be extended to the Clifford bundle. So, what is the Clifford bundle? Cl of Tm. And the vector bundle over M, whose fibers at every point X in M are the complex Clifford algebra, CLN. So this is CL TXM at the point X. So that's the Clifford bundle. So the extension of gamma will also be denoted 
3 gamma and defined as follows gamma uh, from the CLTM instead of TM uh, into the endomorphism of sigma M so how do you write any element in CLTM? You write it as x1, x2, Clifford xk, and gamma of x1, xk is defined by gamma x1 around gamma x2 around the composition gamma xk. So of course, uh, the function gamma which is defined from Tm uh, into the endomorphism of sigma m can be extended to the comp to the Clifford bundle CLTM as follows. So x1 Clifford x2 Clifford xk gamma of x1 Clifford x2 Clifford xk is the composition of gamma of x1 gamma x2 and gamma of xk. Um, <coughs> And uh, so at every point x, so now at every point x, gamma, again, CL, TXM, which is the complex Clifford algebra, of course, sigma is uh, the complex vector bundle of rank L. So the first two points x it defined is a representation of CLN of complex dimension. Ah. So I was able to define a representation of the complex Clifford algebra of complex dimension L. Don't forget what we said yesterday that the complex Clifford algebra and for example, in the even case, has a unique representation, but of complex dimension two integer part of n over two. So the L here is not necessarily the integer part um, of n over two, or two to the power of the integer part of n over two. And now you will see in the special case when L is two to the power of the integer part of n over two, I'm going to call this Dirac bundle a spin C structure and D I'm going to call, to call it the Dirac operator. And in this case, we know that this complex representation is unique. So I'm ready now to define the spin C structure and the Dirac operator on my manifold M. So as I said, now we are ready to define what does it mean a spin C structure on a manifold. So definition, a spin C structure on M is a Dirac bundle. So again, this is a complex vector bundle of rank L, a connection, a Hermitian metric, and a map gamma that satisfies the follow the three previous property. But now of rank normally L. But now we take L to be two to the integer part of n over two. So as explained in the previous um, slides, we need at every point x to get a reducible um, to supply at a so the Dirac bundle supplying at every point x and a reducible representation of CLN. So in other terms. It is a Dirac bundle supplying at every point X in M and a reducible representation of CLN. So in this case, gamma will be called the Clifford multiplication, sigma m the spinner bundle,
a section of the spinner bundle will be called a spinner field and of course we will call the, the Dirac operator so in fact a spin C structure is a Dirac bundle with a specific rank and this rank which is 2 integer part of n over 2 will give us at every point x the extension of the Clifford multiplication of gamma will be a reducible representation of the complex Clifford uh, algebra and now I can announce my second proposition proposition so I have a Riemannian manifold spin C so I have a Dirac bundle with rank 2 into the part of an over 2 then the determinant line bundle so what is the determinant line bundle so you have the complex vector bundle and then you take its determinant of course you are going to get a complex line bundle and this complex line bundle has a root of index 2 integer part of n over 2 minus 1 it means that there exists a complex line bundle that from now on I'm going to denote it by L such that on M of course such that L 2 integer part of N over 2 minus 1 is the determinant of sigma of M so again uh, it's not true in general but when I have a spin C structure I can prove and I will do it in a few minutes uh, that you can always find a complex line bundle L which is a root uh, of index 2 integer part of n over 2 of another complex vector bundle complex line bundle which is the determinant of sigma of m this complex line bundle L is called the auxiliary line bundle associated with the spin C structure and of course maybe if for people familiar with the spinorial geometry they are asking uh, what what is then the spin uh, structure and what is the difference between spin and spin C structure I'm going to give it later on in by giving many examples but now every time you have a complex you have a spin C structure you can always prove that you can there exists a complex line bundle that I'm going to denote it by L and we'll call it the auxiliary line bundle and this will be a root of index 2 integer part of n over 2 minus 1 of the following line complex line bundle that of sigma of n so I'm going to prove the existence of such a complex uh, line bundle so I'm going to start the proof however I'm not going to do the proof uh, for both cases but I'm going to consider let's say n is odd in the odd case so first of all I'm going to denote by phi i j the transition functions these are the transition functions of the complex vector bundle of the spinner bundle uh, sigma of m and I know that at every point x gamma uh, is given by the irreducible, the unique irreducible representation of the complex Clifford algebra that we have denoted already yesterday by gamma 2m plus 1 and if you remember we have proved that gamma 2m plus 1 
the even part of Cl2 n plus 1 is the automorphism of sigma 2 n. So that's what we did yesterday. So uh, we can define psi ij to be the composition of these are the automorphism and we have seen that it is an isomorphism so cl 2m plus 1 0 that's gamma 2m plus 1 the inverse those are the composition between the transition function of the spinner bundle and gamma minus 1 of 2m plus 1 and uh, so or you can just write it uh, then that phi ij is gamma 2m plus 1 around psi ij. Great. But we know also that gamma x squared, that the property of gamma minus uh, uh, the, scale, the norm of x squared. So the, then this gives you that the depth of gamma x squared is x to the integer part of n over 2 plus 1, of course. And then if you define the following map as q, like square, from cl2 n plus 1, 0, and to c star, for every element here, lambda v1 dot v2 dot v2k give you lambda squared v1 squared etc vk squared so uh, it's very easy to check that determinant of phi ij squared of course at the point x is determinant of gamma 2 m plus 1 of psi ij at the point x of course square but we have just in the previous step we said that gamma of x squared is minus x squared so i can write it here as uh, this sq applied to psi ij of x to the power two integer and over two and of course if i take the complex line bundle whose uh, transition function are sq of psi ij it's clear that i am uh, this uh, this complex line bundle satisfies l2 the power 2 integer part of n over 2 minus 1 is determined of sigma of n so hence the line bundle whose transition function or sq of psi ij i'm going to denote by l ij satisfies l2 integer part of n over 2 minus 1 is that of sigma of n and i get my result so having a spin c structures automatically you can prove or you can have or it, uh, it let it exist a complex line bundle <coughs> denoted by L called the auxiliary line bundle <coughs> and this complex line bundle to the power 2 integer part of n over 2 minus 1 is determinant of sigma of n. Now I'm ready to give uh, in my last part for today many examples and remarks. So uh, First example, every Kähler manifold has a spin C structure carrying parallel. So what does it mean, parallel spinner? It means there exists 
spinner field psi such that nabla psi is identically zero. And um, I, will, I would love here to give you the full details why every Kähler manifold M has a spin C structure scaling parallel spinner. Of course, uh, I need to find a, a good map, a linear map gamma that satisfy one, two, three, and a Hermitian metric, a good connection, so I can define the Dirac bundle, and this Dirac bundle should be of rank two integer part of n over two. So in this case, I say that my manifold is spin C, and I have I can define the Dirac operator. So let's see why every k manifold is spin C. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take the manifold to be Kähler, so I have even dimension n to n, and I'm going to denote by j the complex structure, and of course you know that j squared satisfy minus identity, where j is tn, endomorphism from tn to tm. Uh, this can be extended to the complexification, of course, so if I can define uh, TCM, I'm going to do it by TCM, the complexification of the tangent bundle, and then G, or J, sorry, can be extended to TCM. And which satisfy also J squared as minus identity, and hence I can write my TCM as I can decompose it as split it into two parts, T10 of M plus T01 M of M, where I'm going to denote uh, T10 of M, the eigen sub-bundle of Tm, of TCM, corresponding to the eigenvalue I, and T0M corresponding to the eigenvalue uh, minus I. So this is a set of all that in TCM such that uh, J of Z is I Z and T0 1 of M is a set of all Z corresponding to the eigenvalue minus I. And of course, I can moreover uh, define the bundle of complex forms. So I'm going to define uh, R0 of M to be the R form, the R complex form, or the complex R form of type Z10, uh, so that's 10, the dual of T10 of M, the dual bundle, and then I take uh, the R form, uh, that's why I'm denoting R0 here. For example, if R is equal to M, Uh, omega M, uh, sorry, the M0 form is a complex line bundle, call it the canonical bundle of the Kähler manifold. Okay, in the special case when R is uh, equal to M. And so I, I, so this is the R form, of, of the complex R form of type one zero. Of course, you can define uh, the complex R form of type zero one, but I need to only here to define the R form of type one zero. And then I'm going to uh, take sigma n to be the complex form of type star zero of m, which is all complex R4 of type 1, 0. So all 1 form, 2 form, every R forms. So from 0 to M. Of course, it's a complex line bundle. Uh, sorry, it's a complex vector bundle. And we know that it is of rank 2M. Uh, and don't forget what is M. 
it's the integer part of n over 2 because n is 2n, the dimension is even. So this is a good candidate to be a my complex vector bundle or to be a Dirac bundle with uh, the specific rank. So it might define for me a spin C structure. Uh, now I'm going to define uh, the Hermitian uh, metric. So we define on T10. We define the following metric ZW to be the complexification of the Riemannian metric ZW bar. We know it. And, uh, and the, then we extend the Levi Civita connection. So the extension of the Levi Civita. connection to T10 of M and the Hermitian metric are compatible. So I'm really trying to define all the ingredients that I need to define a spin structure. So I already have a connection, I already have a Hermitian uh, metric, I already have a complex vector bundle of a good rank, two integer part of n over 2. I still need to define gamma uh, with, a, with the property 1, 2, 3. And in my case, I'm going to take on the gamma of Tm to the sigma of m. So don't forget uh, my sigma m here um, is the, form, the complex form of type star 0 of m. So for every x, I'm going to, de to define it using the wedge product and the interior product. So gamma of x is uh, defined as follows. If you apply it to any form of type, of type star 0, you are going to uh, define it as follows. 1 over radical 2, x minus i, j of x, wedge omega minus radical 2 x interior product with omega. So uh, this particular, uh, or this choice of gamma, it's not so hard uh, to prove that uh, this gamma will satisfy condition 1, 2, and 3. And hence, my manifold is can see And much more than that, it carries parallel spinners because just take the complex because sigma of m is uh, here in my case uh, the form of type star zero. So just take uh, the form of type zero zero, which are the complex functions, and then take the complex function, any complex constant functions, let's say one. So, uh, of course, nabla of, of this constant complex function is zero, so we call it a separate spinner, okay? So, carrying parallel spinners, just take the complex constant function. Maybe now you are asking what will be the auxiliary light bundle of my spin C structures here. And uh, let's see, let's try to calculate or to find this complex line bundle. So I know that my complex line bundle L is the determinant of the form of type star zero of M to uh, two to the power one minus M in my case. And then if you try uh, to calculate the function class uh, of L, uh, it's not so hard to find that C1 of L is uh, 2, 1 minus N, C1 of omega, uh, of the form of type star 0. And this is 2, 1 minus M because the form of type star 0 is a, is a direct sum of all the form of type R0, so sigma R from 0 to M, R0 of M, which is equal to 1 minus M M. 
and choose all. The third German class of T10 star of N, the dual of T10 of N. And, uh, but of course, this is, of course, uh, this quantity here can be written as 1, so this is T1, T10 star of N, which is, of course, the third German class of form of type N because I'm in the complex dimension. And as, uh, as I gave a few minutes ago the remark, this is what we call the canonical bundle that I'm going to denote by Km. The canonical bundle of the Kähler structures. So they have the same Chern class. So my complex line bundle uh, defining the spin structure or the auxiliary line bundle is in my case the canonical bundle of the Kähler structure. Um, so that's why every Kähler manifold has a spin structure. Another way to define a spin structure is for, for people who like topology. Um, so if you have, um, um, we can say that your manifold is spin so that's the definition is only for people who like topology, if and only if the second stiffel whitney class of your manifold is equal to the third Schirmer class of some, of some complex line bundle, modulo 2. And of course, this complex line bundle for some L, complex line bundle. And this, of course, this complex line bundle will be the auxiliary uh, line bundle defining the spin C uh, structure. So this is the if and only if uh, from a topological uh, point of view. Now, in the special case, when L is uh, a square complex line bundle, So what does it mean, L is a square complex line bundle? It means that uh, there exists uh, T, a complex line bundle, such that T uh, squared is L. Then, of course, the second stiffel whitney class will be zero, and in this case, the spin C structure is called a spin structure. So what is a spin structure? So this is a particular case of a spin C structure when the auxiliary line bundle has a square uh, so when you have another complex line bundle T, uh, whose squared is L, in this case the second stiffel Whitney class is zero because it's modulo two, the first term class of L, and in this case we say that your manifold is spin. And however, one can we choose when can. One can prove. that we can always uh, choose L to be trivial when M is spin. So of course when M is spin, as I said, L has uh, L is a square, um, but we can always we can prove that we can always choose L to be trivial when your M is uh, a spin manifold. So roughly, when you have a, a spin C structure with a trivial auxiliary line bundle, then this line then I'm going to call it spin manifold. And when you the, your auxiliary line bundle is not trivial. This is a, sp a spin C structure. Uh, this is a specific spin C structure. I'm going to finish today with my last 
uh, example, I'm going to take CPM, the complex projective space, a spin if M is odd, and uh, but if M is even, like CP2 for example, CPM is not spin. However, in any dimension, uh, for any M, CPM is spin C because uh, it's a Kähler manifold. Okay, I'm not going to prove it here uh, in my mini course, but as I said, every Kähler manifold is spin C, but of course, not every manifold is spin C, uh, is spin, sorry. Here, here is an example of CPM, which is spin only if M is odd, and if M is even, it is not spin. So of course, having uh, a spin many have is having a spin structures on M, it implies that you have a trivial. That's what we call the trivial spin C structures. However, uh, the converse is not true. Uh, if you have a spin C structure, it doesn't mean that your auxiliary line bundle is trivial. So tomorrow I'm going to proceed and try to um, talk more about uh, the schrodinger lichtenau of its formula and the Dirac operator, how we can relate it to the geometry of the manifold and, and uh, the geometry of the complex line bundle before starting to restrict my structures from my manifold to my hypersurface or to any sub-manifold.